I'm David Adams. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the fifth ATS Mitral Conclave. Hi, I'm Dr. Randy Martin, and I'm really happy to be joined by Dr. Pat McCarthy. Pat, good to see you as always. Thanks, Randy. Good to be here. So the, the mitral conclave is a, is a really unique meeting for me as a cardiologist. I'm sure it is for you. These are all your colleagues, and you've been here. But you, you talked or you've given a, a, a lecture here on why you choose bioprosthetic valves in young people. Okay. Yep. A little controversial. Tell me a little bit about it that. It is. So there have been a couple of papers out about how the, there might be a survival difference in patients who are particularly young, like in their 40s, right. if they get a mechanical valve versus a bioprosthetic valve and things. You know, there may be something to that. On the other hand, these aren't randomized trials. The level of evidence isn't that great. You know, you can do as best you can with propensity matching, but can't really account for the confounders. The thing that really I, I, we need to consider though is that, okay, why would a patient die with a bioprosthetic valve? Because of the reoperation, because they had to go through this. And STS database indicates that's pretty high risk. It's like 8% that risk. What if we were able to take that away with mitral valve and valve? Mm -hmm. And the results in mitral valve and valve are looking actually very good. So with the durability for bioprotheses right. these days, these patients are going to have 15, 20 years, most of them, right. even though they're younger, before they need another intervention. And you look at how fast TAVR evolved in 10 years, 15, 20 years from now, doing a mitral valve and valve ought to be pretty easy. It's a great landing zone and it's a big valve. So, so you're saying that you, you're doing it um, for two reasons. One, it give, you have an option down the line which gives them in, in, in easier survival or durability or outcome benefit, correct? Correct. What about what about the anticoagulation issue and things like so that? So it's almost like a given. When you talk to patients at that age in particular, a lot of patients are very active these days, and so you can offer them a valve where they're on lifelong anticoagulation. I, I won't even hold out the hope that they're going to go on a NOAC with mm -hmm. a mechanical mitral valve uh, because yeah. the data are not great and then they constantly have that thromboembolism risk and a risk for a stroke. Uh, or the other one where they sort of forget about it, but they take an aspirin and someday they have to deal with it again. Uh, but in our field, things get safer. They don't get less safe right. over time. Right. And so 15, 20 years from now, they should have a safe alternative. What, Pat, what do you, um, I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but, but tell me a little bit, because you've always been an innovator and, uh, you're obviously involved in the transcatheter mitral valve replacement field. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts yes. about that? So for mitral valve and valve is different. It's right. a great no, landing I'm talking about zone mitral that works valve well. Yeah, that one's a lot harder to do. So the issue with that has been we've had a lot of patients screen out for anatomic reasons. There's outflow tract obstruction, the annulus is too big, the annulus is too small, there's too much calcium, there's too much this. And so it's been a bit frustrating to get it in there. The other thing that is gonna be a challenge for the field was that they targeted functional mitral regurg, which was gonna be a lot of those patients. That's also the population that co-apt uh, show they can effectively treat. So. There'll be patients that anatomically can't be treated with a clip, uh, and they may still be good patients, but uh, you know, as much as we're screening a lot of patients, trying to put them into the, those protocols, and uh, I think we've put in about four. And uh, you know, they do work really well, though. They're, it's a really good option. But. Do, you, do, you, do you see um, you know, the, the advances, and I'm not, I don't want to get away from the surgical side, but the advances in transcatheter therapies are pretty staggering when you think about it with annuoplasty cords, clips, you know, all those sort of things. How, you know, as, as a director of a, of a vibrant program, how do, you, how do you structure that on, how do you train your guys, who, and gals, who's going to be doing it? Yeah. You know, yeah. all those sort of things. What well, are your thoughts? So the nice thing is executive director of the institute, I'm over cardiology and surgery, so I can make it a level playing field. So our surgeons are uh, heavily involved in all of these, including MitraClip, and they do the transeptal punctures, and they're there for the tricuspids that are transcatheter as well. And the TAVR already, they just take rotations, and even though it's almost all through the groin these days, um, the surgeons are actually in there doing it. And that, that team actually 
think it along really well. And so it's been, uh, it's really been good to see it come together. You, um, you've done, you've pioneered a lot of things in the annual plastic field. So what are the, what are your new thoughts on annual plasty? And I'm not talking transgather, I mean a surgical approach, an open surgical approach or yeah, so one of the other talks that I had to give was about annuloplasty, right. and so a lot of it is about sizing. We just had a big session about systolic anterior motion. Right. To me, a lot of that is about adjusting the leaflet to make them small enough and then putting in a big enough ring, and I show my mitral ring sizes, and the bell-shaped curve is way to the right, where a lot of other people's are more in the middle, and, and I tend to put in big rings and almost never see Sam. I've not had a clinical problem in you know probably almost 15 years from Sam, and so um, that's one aspect of it. And then there's the usual kind of debate about flexible, rigid, and you know semicircles and circles and stuff. But you know the other is again I tell them think about the future. And so Myra Guerrero had published something about valve and ring, right, right. but it's not very easy to do with a band, and it's not easy to do with a super rigid ring, and so. Kind of when we're deciding what kind of annuloplasty product we put in, we should have that in mind that even though this 55-year-old may get a perfect result and everything's good, when they're 75 or 80, you know, they may have progression of disease and at that time it sure would be nice if they could uh, get a valve and a ring instead of having a re-operation. Uh, 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 yeah, that's, that's really interesting. My f final question to you, um, working our way to the right here, is the, what are you doing with tricuspid regurgitation now in your mitral patients? Yeah. Okay. So uh, anyone that is moderate or more, they'll get a ring, so right. that's easy. It's okay. the less than moderate, the, you know, it's a little sketchy. We have the CTS net trial going right. on. Should you use annular dilatation? If you use annular dilatation, um, what should be that number? And, and how did we ever come up with 40 millimeters as a number when Gilles Dreyfus said it was 70 millimeters? It's a big difference. So, as long as you don't release this till after AATS, I'll tell you about a paper that we have at AATS, which is that if the patient had pre-op atrial fib, right. even though 97% were treated with a maze, they were at a higher risk for developing late TR, Absolutely. so there's that atrial functional tricuspid and mitral regurgitation. The other is that we did find a relationship with tri cuspid annular diameter, but not until it got to 45 millimeters. So if it was over 45, then that group of patients were at some risk for developing uh, tricuspid regurg, but the guidelines might have been just maybe a little too off the mark at setting a number at 40. I think the, I think the AFib thing is really important though. I mean, that's a really bad marker for progressive tricuspid annular dilatation. It is. But it's it, interesting, even with treatment. Or with even maze, with treatment, know. yeah. And so, uh, you know, we're seeing that more patients that are referred for mitral surgery, and then you talk to them, they've had atrial fib for five or eight years. They had an echo years ago. They didn't have mitral regurge that caused the atrial fib, and they have pretty much annular dilatation right. in a big dilated atrium, and they have mitral and tricuspid regurge. And so I think they were getting much better at recognizing that problem. Good, super. Listen, thanks. Okay, Randy. Learned from you as always. Thanks okay. very much. Enjoyed being always with you. Always a pleasure. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for joining us.